I'm really happy to be here in um, Lubbock. It's my third visit. Uh, the last time I came here was a couple years ago on a cross-country motorcycle trip. Uh, I stopped here for a couple days and saw the, I'm a big Waylon Jennings fan and a big Delbert McClinton fan and also Buddy Holly fan, so, so Lubbock has uh, a, a strong place in musical history for me. Saw that walk of, what's it called, the Walk of Fame? Mm -hmm. Walk of Fame, Buddy Holly statue. Have not yet seen the Buddy Holly Museum. That's going to have to wait for my next trip to, uh, to Lubbock. It's, a, it's, I, it, it's wonderful to be invited here by Steve, um, uh, whom I worked with for many years on matters of higher ed. He's a person of the very highest personal and intellectual integrity and ability, and it's a tribute to Texas Tech that they chose him to head uh, the Institute for the Study of Western Civ. Um, and I'm especially honored to have been invited to talk about a subject that I think is uh, important and timely and somewhat misunderstood, uh, that is to say the meaning of the rule of law and the state of the rule of law uh, today. And uh, as I'll try to make clear, I've been interested in this as a law professor, as I would hope every law professor should be, uh, but I've also been anecdotally involved in episodes that I will uh, talk about uh, to get us started as an introduction that have probably spurred my interest and eventually they spurred me to accept an invitation by the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences to write the entry on the rule of law. So I had to think hard and long about this and I'll hopefully share my thoughts with you and, and, uh, and profit from your own comments. Um, let me talk to you about a few personal anecdotes, uh, three very disparate of uh, personal anecdotes. One was briefly mentioned by Steve. For five years, I had been, uh, uh, while I was a law professor in uh, Canada, I was also named by Quebec's um, Assemblée Nationale to the Commission des droits de la personne, the Quebec Human Rights uh, Commission, which both is an anti-discrimination board and also has the right to quash Quebec laws. And so it has powers akin to powers of courts of uh, review in the United States. If the law is contrary to Quebec's uh, Charte de la Personne, Human Rights Charter, then the board has the right to quash the law. Quebec then can appeal that ruling to the highest court in uh, Quebec. Why do I tell you this first anecdote? Because one day I'm at the meeting of the Human Rights Commission. We would meet once a month for a two-day meeting in Montreal. And I was stunned to find that the following uh, item was on the agenda, a claim by a group of um, welfare recipients. Uh, welfare recipients in Quebec have unions. Everybody's got unions in Quebec and welfare recipients are also unionized. And the Union of Welfare Recipients uh, claimed that they had the right, that the Charter of Human Rights of Quebec gave them the right, gave everybody in Quebec, every adult in Quebec, the right to a one-week vacation in Florida at government expense. I'm not making that up. I'm not exaggerating at all. The Quebec Human Rights Charter talks about dignity, that every Quebecer has the right to dignity. And the claim was that cabin fever and 250 inches of snow and extremely, uh, you know, not seeing the sun for months uh, is such that it deprives one of one's dignity and therefore that, you know, they're not asking for a four-star hotel, a one-star hotel is enough, economy fair, not business class, but just everybody has the right to be down in Florida for one week. Um, this is obviously a totally frivolous uh, claim and then to my shock a majority of my fellow commissioners told me informally that they were intending to accredit it and, uh, and, 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 and declare that there was this right and that the Quebec government had to uh, fund it. I had to engage in a lot of what we call in political science log rolling to prevent this happening. I had to vote in favor of all sorts of things that required me to hold my nose while voting for it just to get enough colleagues to vote against the claim of a right to a week in Florida. And what, what uh, the reason I mention this now is my fellow commissioners made me understand that what they preferred on policy grounds was, because I told them of course, this isn't in the charter. This isn't in the Charter of Rights. There's no case law supporting this. The text doesn't support it. There's nothing that supports it. And they said, if we say it supports it, then it supports it. The law is what we, say, what we say it is, and that's by definition what the law is. That, of course, uh, we have the, might makes right, we have the power. Uh, that is something that's not compatible with the rule of law. Um, after I began teaching at uh, George Mason, I was invited to spend one summer in Madagascar heading a USAID mission shortly after the overthrow of the communist dictator. 
uh, Didier Ratzirac, they, uh, the, the, the new government of Madagascar, asked the United States, it was somewhat scandalous because France expected to be asked, but they asked the United States to come help them reestablish the rule of law after uh, decades of, uh, of, of its having been crushed by communist uh, uh, dictators. And um, uh, so they assembled a team. I've got a civil law background. I speak French about as well as I do, or almost as poorly as I do English. I shouldn't put it that way. And so they, uh, and I know something about economics. They uh, asked me to assemble a team. I assembled a team. I went, I went down there on a non-diplomatic passport, and I was told by the ambassador. He phoned me personally at, at my home <clears throat> in Maryland before I took the flight down there and he said just want to let you know all your expenses are covered I said I know that so anything that's required for you to get into the country any expenses visas and the like that's covered I said no I've checked there's no visa but any expenses don't worry we'll cover the expenses I get to customs in Antananarivo at the air after a very long air, uh, flight from Paris and um, they asked me have you what are you taking into the country are you taking anything into the country that you're leaving here usual stuff that you get at borders, and I said, no, nothing. Uh, leaving any, bringing any computers, only the stuff I'm taking back. Um, any electronic equipment? No, nothing like that. And then started about a 15 minute discussion. And they, they brought out a book this thick, and they went, are you bringing in any uh, clothing that you're not taking? No, and perhaps 50 questions. Finally they said, are you bringing in any papers that you're not taking back? I said, well, I got a heck of a lot of papers on on Madagascar, I'm probably going to trash some of them. So yeah, I guess I am bringing in some papers. And as soon as I said yes, they got excited. Des papiers, il a des papiers. This is all that's happening in French. <laughs> yeah, they've got papers. Uh, they went and looked in all sorts of books and found that I owed them something like eighty-three dollars, which was of course a bribe just to get into the country. That's all it was. I said, of course, I am not paying you one cent. <clears throat> I got the ambassador out of bed, the ambassador came, uh, it was about 11 o'clock in the evening, the ambassador had to come and fetch me and he said, I told you that any expenses you paid would be reimbursed by us. And my answer was, I am here to establish the rule of, to help reestablish the rule of law in Madagascar, I will be damned if I'm going to pay a bribe to get into the country in, in the first place. Um, as part of that mission, I spoke to several law professors at the University of Madagascar, and I've also spoken with, to quite a few law professors in Guatemala, where I'm honored to be a, a recurring visiting professor at what I consider to be Central America's best law school, which is Francisco Marroquin uh, Law School in Guatemala City. And both the law school, both the professors in Madagascar and the ones in Guatemala have admitted to me on several occasions that they feel dishonest being law professors because they teach the law to their students and in fact they know that deep down the law has very little to do with what's going to happen to their students' clients once their students become attorneys. The lawyer's main task in reality wasn't necessarily to know the law but to know how to make the right connections, to know which palms needed to be greased, which people needed to be bribed, which people needed to be threatened, etc. in order to achieve the goals that the client wanted to achieve. All these stories, as well as my own teaching, have heightened my interest in the rule of law. And when I finally got that invitation from the uh, International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences, I was happy to accept it and, and, and work on this. And I think that you should be interested in this question too, not just me, because I think by most, most accounts, and I'll try to make the case, the rule of law is on the decline here. The Heritage Foundation actually has a rule of law measurement every year. Uh, they rank uh, over a hundred countries every year and when they started doing the ranking the United States was never first I'll get to the reasons why we were never first uh, and foremost but we were third or fourth in the world as far as respect for the rule of law is concerned <laughs> in the latest uh, ranking about the rule of law the United States is 24th uh, down from third or fourth we're now beaten by um, New Zealand is first by the way we're beaten by Canada which is fourth we're beaten by Estonia, we are beaten by Chile, we are beaten by Barbados, Belgium, Sweden, uh, and we're in a dead heat tie with Botswana, for example. <laughs> I've got nothing against Botswana, but I'm just saying most people might not have ranked Botswana right up there with the, uh, with the United States. You see that little color there, Botswana. So it is of interest, I think, to, um, to um, uh, it should be of interest to Americans to uh, understand both what the rule of law is and why it's possibly on the decline 
in the United States as, I, as Heritage thinks it is and as I think it is too. And I'll try to divide my comments into two. What is the rule of law? Because that's a very tricky thing to get a handle on and why I think it's in decline in, uh, in America today. So uh, there have been different understandings of the rule of law uh, over the years uh, by different famous people. You can see Thomas Jefferson writing about this and for him, what the rule of law meant was that, was that the, the rule was that the rule of the United States uh, Constitution. The Constitution was supreme and that's what uh, uh, established the rule of law. President Reagan wrote somewhat differently, really it's the rule of law under God, uh, God's law is supreme and the rule of law follows from understanding that God's uh, law is supreme. This gentleman has a third, a different kind of view. He writes, the rule of law is not a commodity to be bought and sold on the free market. And if I understand correctly, the context of this particular uh, protester, for him, the rule of government over markets is the rule of law. Having the possibility to regulate uh, markets and prevent markets from uh, working without uh, uh, impediment, that's what the rule of law uh, would be. So there's many different understandings of what the rule of law is. Um, there, those are not scholarly works. There are some <coughs> scholarly works over the over the past uh, years. Uh, I think just about the best uh, book on this is a book by the late uh, Brian Tamanaha on the rule of law, history, politics, theory. Here's two other books that I, uh, I'll talk about those other books uh, very briefly, but I think the Tamanaha book is the, the best one. He had 190 pages in his book. I had 525 words as my absolute word limit for the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences, so I had to be a little bit more succinct than Tamanaha was, uh, but it's a good book uh, nonetheless. Most of what's been written about the rule of law doesn't try to define it as I did, and as I will in a few minutes, but tried to describe it, which is, uh, which is not exactly the same thing. Uh, and here are three famous descriptions of the rule of law from the 1890s to the 1980s. First, a uh, very famous uh, one by uh, Dicey, a British uh, a constitutionalist. Whenever we talk of Englishmen as loving the government of law or the supremacy of law as being a characteristic of the English Constitution, we're using words which, though they possess a real significance, are nonetheless to most persons who employ them full of vagueness and ambiguity. Not terribly helpful there. Um, uh, Michael Oakeshott, the late Michael Oakeshott, wrote, the rule of law bakes no bread. It is unable to distribute loaves or fishes, it has none, and it cannot protect itself against external assault, but it remains the most civilized and least burdensome conception of a state yet to be devised. Contrast with those two, uh, Professor Judith Schlar in 1987 who wrote, it would not be very difficult to show that the phrase rule of law has become meaningless thanks to ideological abuse and general overuse. It may well have become just another one of those self-congratulatory rhetorical devices that grace the public utterances of Anglo-American politicians. No intellectual effort need therefore be wasted on this bit of ruling class chatter. So I want to maybe uh, waste a little bit of intellectual effort to, because I do think that there is, uh, although I do agree with Schlar that it's been misused and bandied about and used to connote things that are the contrary of what it is, I do think it's extremely profitable to bring it back to its core meaning. So um, let me uh, try to very briefly indicate why it's important to define the rule of law. That is a man with the, ice, with the Islamic State um, flag uh, there. We are arguably fighting a war to institute the rule of law. Uh, we have tried to fight this war in two countries already. We're fighting a war in a region of the world that threatens our national security and where only one nation respects the rule of law. The countries that have lost the rule of law have descended into a barbarism that in the words of one very prominent Arab author in an extraordinary recent essay on political that I very highly recommend to you, have now destroyed Arab civilization. We are involved militarily and we justify our intervention in these countries both altruistically and also strategically. For example, we note that countries that live under the rule of law do not breed terrorist warriors against us. We commit billions in foreign aid from USAID to the Millennium Aid Act to these countries to help them achieve the rule of law. We condition membership in NATO and in the European Union on respect for the rule of law. We feel guilty 
when we travel in pampered luxury in countries that lack the rule of law. So I submit to you that we, we do have a, a need, that it is important to try to figure out what that is, that rule of law thing is. So let me start the definition, if you will, in the negative, by trying to point out to you what I think the rule of law is not. So, and I will end up honing in on the positive. But first, what is the rule of law not? I think the rule of law is not atomistic freedom. The rule of law is not Murray Rothbard's anarcho-capitalist um, um, society. Countries can have social welfare policies, or a progressive income tax, or public school systems, or socialized health care, and still largely respect the rule of law. As I stated earlier, Sweden arguably has as much or more of the rule of law than does the United States. Heritage Foundation, which is certainly no, no fan of Swedish social democracy, uh, ranks Sweden higher than the United States on the rule of law, and I think that that's correct. Secondly, rule of law is not respect for all of the provisions of the U.S. Constitution, despite the Constitution having become our civic religion, if you will. In other words, I believe a country can have an official religion or a hereditary king or a different conception of double jeopardy than we do and still might significantly respect the rule of law. Indeed, I have law degrees from two countries, as uh, Steve uh, implied, and in Canada, for your information, the Crown, which is the prosecution, the Crown can appeal an acquittal just as much as the criminal defendant can appeal a conviction. They don't have the same notion of double jeopardy. That would be utterly unconstitutional in the United States, and yet that doesn't negate the fact that the rule of law generally exists in that country and exists, I think, in a stronger way than it does here today. Uh, notably, I don't think that the rule of law is a synonym for democracy, and what I mean by that is I don't think democracy is sufficient for the rule of law. Plato and others realized, and our founding fathers certainly realized when they set up a mixed system, not a pure democracy, uh, that uh, a democracy can utterly deny the fundamental tenets of the rule of law. But we're learning this presently in Venezuela and possibly uh, in Iraq. A much more interesting correct, uh, question is whether a non-democracy could comply with the rule of law. In other words, democracy may not be sufficient for the rule of law, but is it necessary? Is some kind of democracy necessary for the rule of law? And let me call that the Hong Kong question. That's playing out today, right now, in Hong Kong, as we speak. Um, my colleague Frank Buckley, in the third of those three books that I put on, the, uh, on an earlier screen, opined on this subject that the rule of law can be thought of in two ways, thick and thin. The thin rule of law, which would be the outsider's rule of law, means you can do business in a country without any worry that the government's going to expropriate you, but you might not want to live there because the most basic political and civil rights are not protected. With respect, I think Frank Buckley's thin rule of law is not the rule of law as far as I'm concerned. So yes, I do see some form of democracy as necessary, though not at all sufficient for the rule of law. Finally, the rule of law is not the same as legalism. The rule of, of law is, is not the same as compliance with laws, uh, with statutes. Strict compliance with law is not the same as the rule of law. Soviet legalism and Nazi legalism characterized <coughs> two societies where the rule of law was totally absent. Both regimes made sure that everything they did was in compliance with the awful laws that they enacted. Having said all that, let me try to inch towards a definition of what the rule of law is as opposed to is not. And my own philosophical uh, epistemology, if you will, is similar to that of Judith Jarvis Thompson of MIT. That is to say, I'm very interested in how I think learned people use the term <laughs> rule of law, and that's what I'm trying to unpack here. Do they mean anything by the phrase, or is the late Professor Sklar right, and do they mean nothing tangible by it at all? Is the rule of law the equivalent of beauty? Is it in the eye of the beholder? Is it a purely aesthetic uh, 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 claim? Um, I, uh, I, I think not. I think folks do connote something meaningful and not purely aesthetic by the term rule of law. I also don't think rule of law is like pregnancy. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. I don't think you either have the rule of law or you don't have the rule of law. I think the rule of law is more like, say, a notion like happiness. You can have more of it, you can have less of it. Uh, it's not an on-off um, item. Um, so I wish to put it to you today that a society lives more greatly under the rule of law to the extent that it exhibits the following five characteristics. First, I think in a society governed by the rule of law, the branches of government must respect their roles. I'm, I'm calling this the formal component of the rule of law. So a totalitarian ruler does not act according to the rule of law because by definition he is above the law. 
a dictator who rules by decree. In other words, what he says is by definition law. Um, uh, even if the rule by decree is authorized by a statute by the legislature that allows him to rule by decree, which is currently the case in Venezuela, uh, by the way, that ruler does not act according to the rule of law. Austinian positivism, for those familiar with this, is one thing, the rule of law is something different. <coughs> in essence, I believe the rule of law does require some kind of separation, in other words, between the executive and legislative functions of government. It also, by, by implication, requires an ind a somewhat independent judiciary. That is to say, a part of government to determine whether the executive and the legislative branches have followed the law, including, of course, the Constitution. So a chief executive who says he can do whatever is in the country's interest by using his pen and using his phone as he determines it, if in his opinion the legislature has failed to satisfy the public interest, is a chief executive who flouts the rule of law. Secondly, I think laws must be generally obeyed for the rule of law to obtain. This is what I'm going to call the, the internal point of view. That's a phrase used by the legal philosopher H.L.A. Hart. The, the order, as opposed to law and order, the order component of the rule of law. Laws that are on the books but are not, in, but are not complied with by, generally by the population um, can create rule of law problems in two different ways. First, if, say, crime is rampant so that people are not secure in their rights, even if these rights are allegedly guaranteed by a piece of paper, then, the, then there's a rule of law problem for there never are enough police. There never will be enough police to police everybody, to protect everybody. So there has to be this internal point of view. Secondly, in addition to rampant crime, if enforcers are corrupt, if there's corruption, Differential treatment will happen for a differential for people under the same rules, and that is a distinct rule of law problem. Both of these problems plague parts of some of the United States' large cities, and to a lesser extent, some rural areas. And to that extent, the United States has a rule of law problem uh, that other societies, for example, Canada to some extent, and Denmark, don't really have. On this account, for example, a state can be too weak. As in large parts of Pakistan and Mexico, the state uh, cedes to hoodlums certain areas of the country. Or the state can be ubiquitous and, and corrupt, uh, as is the case in many Latin American countries. Both of these are rule of law problems. Note that the fact that a government is small doesn't, doesn't make it too small. Um, Botswana has a very small government, but an excellent rule of law because it has an extremely widely shared internal point of view. People obey the law, share uh, these values. Similarly, on the other side, analogously, the presence of a large government uh, does not make the government totalitarian or corrupt. Israel has tremendous internal point of view by its citizens, but of course it has great need for defense against foreign enemies that are bent on its destruction, and therefore it needs lots of police, despite the extreme peaceability of its internal populace. In general, bars on doors, bars on windows, steel gratings over storefronts, bulletproof windows in taxi cabs, massive hiring of armed bodyguards by the rich, all these are signs of the weakness of the internal point of view. Third, laws must be known and of reasonably limited number. This is what I call a totalitarian prohibition. If there is a ubiquity of laws, such that at any time anybody can be charged with a breach of a law, then the rule of law is severely at risk. Fourth, and I'll talk about that in greater length, at greater length in a minute. Fourth, the law must decide similar cases similarly. That is to say, <laughs> principle and not policy must guide the judiciary. This is an extremely important insight that was originally made by Ronald Dworkin, a legal philosopher at Oxford. The judiciary cannot function by policy the same way that the legislature may function. The judiciary has to function through principle. The principle, once applied, has to be constantly applied, commonly applied, coherently applied to others. This implies judicial restraint. Judges cannot use their hermeneutic power, their interpretive power, to implement their policy preferences. From this perspective, judicial activism, that is to say judges creating law to fit their perception of the nations or the states, policy needs can be as pernicious as corruption in subverting the rule of law. By the way, this component of the rule of law implies, in my view, that process must reign supreme over substance in judicial proceedings, uh, and also implies a relatively robust rule of precedent. Once interpreted in one way, legal meaning will hold against others who are similarly situated, absent very compelling reasons. 
And fifth and last, fundamental human rights are respected by the state. This is what I might call the natural law component of the rule of law. Ron Cass, in the second of the three books that I put in that, on that earlier screen indicating scholarly works on the rule of law, Ron Cass essentially missed this fifth component in his book. So does Frank Buckley in his introduction to his edited essays. I think generally that economists, and both Buckley and Cass are legal economists, I think economists tend to, tend to miss this uh, point in general. If a, if a, if a polity has, rule, has components one through four, that might constitute rule by laws, small l, laws, but not the rule of law, capital L, law. Nazi Germany exhib exhibited rules by, rule by laws to a great extent. Iran may, may well do so today. Venezuela is apparently self-consciously practicing rule by laws, including expropriation of property and denial of free speech whenever the legislature deems it appropriate. Other languages than English have an easy way to understand this. For example, a language I, I know well, French, uses the word droit, as well as the word loi. Loi is a, an individual law, but the droit the, 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 is, a, is more than the sum of, the, of, of, of its parts. So um, up in Canada, we would translate rule of law in French as le règne du droit, not the reign of droit, not the reign of laws, not small l laws, but the reign of capital L law. I like to use that term in English, capital L law versus small l laws, because English lacks two different words, which other, other languages uh, don't lack. Um, in a society governed by the rule of law, all people are equal before the law, generally. That doesn't mean that laws, that every law applies to everybody, of course. Laws are meaningless if they don't discriminate between people. We have different voting laws for children than we do for adults. We have different voting laws for citizens than we do for non-citizens. Laws are all about, to some extent, in some way, discriminating. I'm using the word discriminate in a non-pejorative sense of the term, obviously. The point, of course, is that the discrimination must be philosophically le legitimate and not invidious. A society where dimmies may be beaten at will and where they are forced to pay a tax because of their uh, religion is a society with a rule of law problem. Um, to take a subject that I know something about, as Stephen indicated, rampant sovereign immunity in tort, where an employee who does something harmful to you is not liable if he happens to work for the government, which is an American problem, sovereign immunity, much more than it is in other English-speaking countries. That creates a rule of law problem in the United States. Standing to sue obstacles, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, when a citizen wishes to challenge the illegality of a government action, uh, standing to sue problems uh, create de facto immunity for the illegality of government actions, and that creates a real um, uh, rule of law problem. Let me now uh, move on and try to <laughs> sketch out ways in which I think that there has been, that I think the Heritage Foundation is onto something, that there has been a decline in the rule of law in the United States. First, there's been a vast proliferation of laws, small l laws, reducing capital L law, encouraging nihilism, increasing corruption. <coughs> Boston civil liberties lawyer Harvey Silverglate called his book Three Felonies a Day. What was that? That referred to the number of crimes that he estimates that the average American commits because of the proliferation of thousands upon thousands of laws and regulations, many of which are so vague that almost anybody can be charged with their violation at any time. Gene Healy's book, Go Directly to Jail, the criminalization, the subtitle is The Criminalization of Almost Everything, introduces us to the expanding federal criminal code, which now includes, to the extent that scholars can even count them, over 5,000 crimes. These federal crimes have come loose from the common law moorings that punished evil and, acqu and acquitted good. By eliminating the traditional requirement that a person is guilty only if he commits a guilty act motivated by a guilty mind, the federal legislator has turned a traditional criminal sanction into another tool in the regulatory toolkit. As the book jacket to Healy's book explains, an unholy alliance of tough on crime conservatives right-wing and anti-big business liberals, left-wing, has utterly transformed federal criminal law into a trap for the unwary. More on that in a minute. Second, if everybody breaks the law all the time, enforcement of the laws must be selective. This is especially a problem in securities law. 
if anybody here is familiar with that, which Congress has left intentionally vague, encouraging regulators and prosecutors to try people even when the law is utterly unclear. Essentially, trust me on this, any corporation can be charged at any time and the cost of defending oneself and the risk of conviction is so great that settling with government, federal government prosecutors is the only wise counsel that a corporation's attorney can give. But it's not only about securities law, it's everywhere. This results in differing application of the laws to different folks, often depending on uh, uh, political considerations from popularity to support of the ruling party through campaign contributions. Famously, the White House emailed the CEOs of the biggest pharmaceutical firms during the Affordable Care Act debate. The email said that because of the support that the big pharmaceutical concerns had given to the Affordable Care Act, the administration would for now continue to administratively ban imports of prescription drugs from Canada. Canada has price controls, prescription drugs are much cheaper there, the idea was to import them here and arbitrage the difference. The email said because you back us, we will not, we will not, uh, we're going to regulate in your favor. In this way, the proliferation of the administrative state, about which I'll have more to say in a minute, is like a constant protection racket that is, of course, antithetical to the rule of law. Um, in two, uh, now, let me get to, uh, to arbitrary police actions. Um, in 2013, prosecutors in Washington uh, decided that they would not prosecute NBC anchor David Gregory for violating Washington, D.C.'s extremely strict gun laws, which he had just blatantly and openly violated by taking a very large magazine, uh, illegal in Washington, D.C., to the Washington, D.C. studio and talking about it uh, on a TV show. Washington prosecutors decided that they would not prosecute uh, David Gregory. But in 2014, prosecutors in Atlantic City, New Jersey, <laughs> decided that they would charge Pennsylvania resident Shanine Allen, age 27. Ms. Allen, who had no criminal record, had legally acquired a firearm one week earlier, one week prior to her arrest. She was headed to Atlantic City, New Jersey in the early morning hours to prepare for her son's birthday party. She had purchased her gun for protection after being robbed twice at gunpoint in the past year. She had legally obtained a concealed carry permit pursuant to Pennsylvania law. She was pulled over for swerving one foot to the left in her 2007 Chevrolet sedan, and when asked for her driver's license, she gave the license to the New Jersey State Trooper, and she informed him that she had a firearm in her car, just as she had been instructed to do in the class that she had taken to get her carry permit. Quote, I was bringing a cake, and I was bringing a cake and the dog to the hotel room to surprise my son for his birthday. That's what I was doing out there, and I got pulled over at one in the morning because I was sleepy and swerved for a split second, touching the center line. That swerve gave the trooper a probable cause to stop her. She had a spotless driving record and no criminal record. She faces a minimum of three. She, she faced a minimum of three and a half years in the penitentiary, as I'll point out in, in, in just a minute. Her real crime, though, I think, was not being David Gregory or her real crime, perhaps, was not being Ray Rice. For that same Atlantic City prosecutor's <coughs> office had declined to prosecute Baltimore Ravens player Ray Rice, who was caught on video knocking unconscious his fiance with a punch to the face. The, lo the local prosecutor um, uh, selected Rice for New Jersey's pretrial intervention program, which allows first-time offenders to avoid criminal, uh, criminal conviction after a period of supervised rehabilitation. Meanwhile, the same prosecutor refused to show Allen the same leniency. Instead, he, here's the deal that he offered her. He said she could complete three and a half years in maximum security at a state penitentiary of a possible 10-year prison sentence, and then she would be eligible for parole. She had two young children. Last week, after national political pressure, uh, this prosecutor in Atlantic City relented, and Miss Allen will go to the same program as Mr. Rice. After, of course, she has spent 40 days in jail, separated from her children who were given up to uh, child protection during those 40 days. So in Madagascar and Guatemala, it's not what you know, it's who you know. In America, we now have thousands more laws than in Madagascar and Guatemala. It's getting easier to prosecute anybody without the right connections. Maybe U.S. law professors, too, need to tell our students that we need to know more about who to bribe, who to threaten, who to lobby, as opposed to uh, hoping that the law will be applied <laughs> evenly. In a 2007 article in Slate magazine entitled American Law Breaking, there's a Columbia law professor named Timothy Wu who described a popular game in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. The game is to name a famous person, for example, Mother Teresa, John Lennon, 
name a famous person, and then decide how you could prosecute that famous person federally. Let me read from the Slate article. Thomas Wu used to work in that office. He's describing the game that was played in that office. It would be up to the junior prosecutors to figure out a plausible federal crime for which to indict him or her. The crimes are not rape, murder, or other crimes that you see on law and order. Those are state crimes. They require evil intent. But rather the incredibly broad yet obscure crimes that populate the U.S. Code like a kind of jurisprudential minefield. Crimes like false statements, which is a felony, five years in prison. Misuse of the mail, five years in prison. Honest services, up to 30 years in prison. False, premises on the, false pretenses on the high seas, five years in prison. The trick and skill lay in finding the most obscure offenses. That the person who would win the game would find the most obscure federal offense. The result of the game was always the same for every celebrity, prison time, as long as we wanted it. That's not the rule of law. Across the country, police forces are taking hundreds of millions of dollars from motorists that are not charged with any crime under authorization by federal laws passed after 9-11. Thousands of people have been forced to fight legal battles that last more than a year and cost them a fortune in lawyers' fees to get their money back. Under the federal equitable sharing program, local police have seized 2.5 billion, that's 2,500 million dollars since 2001 from people who were not charged with a crime without any warrant being issued by a judge. About 1.7 billion of that was sent back to local law enforcement with 800 million retained by the federal government as its cut. That is Mr. Mandrell Stewart of Virginia on top. You're gonna to see their stories in just a minute. I'm gonna show you a seven minute clip. You're gonna see the story of a Virginia man who was defended by one of my students uh, from George Mason Law School, I'm proud to say. And you're gonna see the story of a Michigan man. This isn't about Virginia law or Michigan law. This is about federal law and literally highway robbery. This is the uh, release that he had to sign where he's, he's giving the money essentially to the uh, Nevada County. This is the money he was given by his father for the, for the move. I've indicated two ways in which there's been the decline of the rule of law in the United States. The thir a third way is the rise of the administrative state. I really want to recommend this excellent book to you by law professor Philip Hamburger. Uh, it's a 2013 book called Is Administrative Law Unlawful? Hamburger makes the case that the rise of binding and ubiquitous administrative power, delegated powers that are above the law, not really reviewed by the courts, thanks to, thanks to something called the Chevron Doctrine, wherein courts give extreme deference to regulatory bodies, is profoundly antithetical to the rule of law, according to Hamburger, and I think he's right. Administrative agencies bypass the legislative process, and they also bypass the judicial process. They create their own adjudicative processes with judges who are not independent. Um, let me talk about judicial restraint. I, I'm not really going to talk about presidential restraint because of, uh, because of uh, time constraints and because I don't want this to appear to be a politicized talk. It's not meant to be that. The rule of law is incompatible with the courts making up the law to suit its policy preferences, even if we approve of such preferences. I won't talk a heck of a lot about this. It's a little bit politically charged. Let me just highlight two cases. First. Current litigation about the Affordable Care Act is of vital interest to those who support the rule of law, in my opinion. Whether or not you support the Affordable Care Act is irrelevant to what I'm about to talk about. In Halbig versus Burwell, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit um, um, voided an IRS regulation that gave tax subsidies uh, to individuals who purchased health insurance through exchanges run by the federal government. The regulation was not allowed by the enabling law because the law only allowed subsidies when the sign-up was through an exchange run by a state. Meanwhile, in Richmond, a panel of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals held the exact opposite in King versus Burwell. It concluded that the IRS had the power to authorize such subsidies. The Fourth Circuit's reasoning, uh, Virginia is in the Fourth Circuit, my law school is in the in Maryland in, is in the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit's reasoning is among the most non-juridical I have ever seen in 27 years at George Mason. Um, essentially, the ruling says, we think it's a pretty good outcome, therefore it must be legal. Uh, it's, this is result-oriented and not process-oriented. The Affordable Care Act specifically says that the federal government can provide subsidies only for insurance bought on exchange established by a state. There is no mention whatsoever of extending the subsidies to those who purchase coverage 
on an exchange that's established by the federal government. The language of the statute is not ambiguous, so the Justice Department was forced to argue that the IRS rule was a valid exercise of authority to implement the intent of the law. And the intent of the law, said DOJ, could not have been for Americans in states that refused to set up exchanges to be unable to claim the tax credit or subsidy just because the federal government had to step in and set up an exchange itself. But in fact, that was exactly so, if you read the debates and look at the video. The thought was quite explicitly that the states would be bribed to establish exchanges because otherwise they would deprive their citizens of the federal subsidies. The Halbig decision by the DC Circuit uh, panel is over 70 pages long, but the essence of the case is well summarized in a pithy concurrence by senior judge Ray Randolph. Randolph writes, quote, an exchange established by the federal government cannot possibly be an exchange established by the state. To hold otherwise would be to engage in distortion of language, not interpretation of language. Only further legislation could accomplish the expansion the government needs. Uh, the government <laughs> seeks, sorry. Randolph did not oppose or support such legislation. That's not his role. His role is merely to interpret the legislation that's out there. And then two weeks ago, the entire DC circuit, in an unmotivated opinion, said that they were quashing that panel. This is a circuit whose majority has just been changed uh, due to recent nominations as a result of what is sometimes called the nuclear option, if you're familiar with um, um, the change in US Senate rules that allowed uh, certain uh, nominations to be made to be uh, successful that otherwise would not have been successful. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Judge White in the U.S. District Court in Oklahoma struck down the same Affordable Care Act rule. It will, and that's going to now be appealed to the Tenth Circuit, whose composition has also been changed. So I anticipate that that's also going to go by the wayside. It's the same rule. Might makes right. We're in the majority. It's exactly what the Quebec Human Rights Commission told me when they wanted to authorize uh, one week vacation in, in Fort Lauderdale, despite the lack of any textual uh, support for this, uh, for that nonsense. Um, I'm not going to talk about presidential abuse of the rule of law unless we have time during the question period. Um, as I told you, it's both for time reasons and also because uh, I don't want this to, I do not mean this to be uh, an ad hominem thing. Um, I will talk about Attorney General abuse of the rule of law, because the Attorney General is the one entrusted with, uh, with enforcing the rule of law. That is his only job. And President Obama's Attorney General, who announced his resignation last week, has almost certainly been the most disgraceful dis defender of the rule of law since Watergate's John Mitchell in 1977. Eric Holder has been found in contempt of Congress for withholding subpoenaed documents and for providing perjurious statements about an illegal gun walking caper that his office was responsible for in Mexico and which resulted in the death of a U.S. Border Patrol agent. You all in Texas may know more about that than many people do up in Maryland and Virginia. Eric Holder has illegally billed the federal government for his own private use of government Gulfstream jets to see the Belmont Stakes horse race in New York with his own two daughters and their male companions. He has refused to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate what the Inspector General of the Treasury has determined to be improper targeting of conservative groups by IRS officials, including Ms. Lois Lerner, thereby de facto exempting Ms. Lerner and her colleagues from the law. He has flouted American legal tradition and international law by trying to create civilian trials for war criminals such as Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, an architect of the 9-11 attacks and the man who personally slit the throat of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl. He has refused, Holder has refused to prosecute the New Black Panthers for preventing Caucasians from voting in Philadelphia in the 2008 general election. He has constantly, and despite utter lack of support from case law or statutes, insisted that all states that wish to require an ID to vote are racist, just as he has suggested that desiring the enforcement of federal immigration law is racist. In 2008, the Supreme Court upheld Indiana's photo photo voter ID law, which has become a model for many states. The court found no evidence that such laws disproportionately affect minorities. Minority participation in Indiana rose in subsequent statewide elections, including the non-presidential election year of 2010. Same thing has happened in Georgia, same thing has happened in Texas, but states that are afraid to confront the wrath of the federal, that prefer not to spend tens of millions of dollars on legal fees, uh, decide to um, 
uh, declined to um, impose any, any voter ID. Prior to becoming Attorney General under President Obama, Eric Holder was Deputy Attorney General under President Clinton, and he negotiated Clinton's very last day in office pardon of the late Mark Rich. Mark Rich was a felon who was facing up to 300 years in prison for illegally trading with Iran, among other crimes, and who had fled to Switzerland to avoid capture. Meanwhile, Mr. Rich had given through his wife $1 million to the Democratic Party, $100,000 to Hillary Clinton's New York Senate campaign, and $500,000 to fund the Clinton Library in Arkansas. On a more micro level, Attorney General Holder, by his body language and his words, has de facto condemned the shooting of a black person by a Hispanic person before due pro Mr. Zimmerman, before due process was ever meted out. And of course, when that due process did happen, the Hispanic man was, as you may recall, acquitted. He has also condemned the shooting of a black man, Michael Brown, in Ferguson, Missouri, by a white police officer, though the facts in that case have yet to be adjudicated. The facts we do know, of course, are that Mr. Brown had just robbed a store, that he was high on marijuana, and that the police officer was battered. But let's not prejudge, let's leave that to an attorney general who has sworn to uphold the rule of law. No, t no comments tend to be forthcoming from this attorney general when the races of victim and alleged perpetrator are reversed, one notices. All of these derogations from the rule of law threaten the legitimacy of our judicial system in the eyes of citizens. Yet it's possible, especially as regards some of the presidential abuses of the rule of law, for example, refusal to enforce certain parts of the Affordable Care Act while enforcing other parts, it's possible that no one has standing to sue uh, under case law that requires that somebody prove a unique and particular harm from the illegalities, not the general harm that any citizen suffers when the Constitution is flouted. Speaker Boehner recently sued to enforce the Affordable Care Act. Notice, he voted against the Affordable Care Act. He's not suing to enforce it because he likes the act. He's suing to enforce it because he's speaker and he's hoping that the courts will find that he has standing to sue, that his damages are more acute than the damages suffered by every other citizen. On September 18th, just about, uh, what, uh, two weeks ago, the attorney who had been hired by Congress to launch the speaker suit backed down, saying that his law firm, Baker Hostetler, had been politically pressured, presumably just the same way that Big Pharma was pressured to support the Affordable Care Act, to drop the, to drop the representation of Congress. This is exactly the kind of danger to the rule of law that you see <coughs> in other countries. Only, um, uh, uh, let, let me move on because I, I want to get to sort of a question period. What should we do about all this? I learned in that summer I spent in Madagascar, I spent four months there, that reestablishing the rule of law once it's been lost is a little bit like getting toothpaste back into the tube. It is difficult. It's um, um, hard to get back. The same government that claimed to want the rule of law tried to hold me up at the border for my papers. Fortunately, we here in the United States have a much more culturally embedded sense of the rule of law than they ever did in Madagascar. Don't get me wrong, we were never at the top of the list. We were never, we were never the most respectful of the rule of law in the world. We uh, are a nation that entrenched uh, slavery. We are a nation that uh, that had Jim Crow. We are a nation uh, guilty of the wholesale disregard of some treaties with Native American tribes, uh, etc. <laughs> but we were doing pretty darn well, and I think Care Heritage's uh, claim that we were third or fourth in the world is probably uh, very accurate. So we have a more entrenched rule of law than they ever did in Madagascar. Um, though our rule of law has been somewhat frittered away, I don't think it's unsalvageable. <clears throat> I think we have to look to reinforce the structures, the forms, the procedures put in place by the founders, structures that worked fairly well until relatively recently. No, uh, again, fairly well does not mean perfectly. We weren't perfect, that doesn't mean we can't get back to, and even better than we're, what we were. I think we should consider changing the, st the requirements for standing to sue, uh, which actually somewhat vary by federal circuit, but I think that they could be established by federal legislation. Uh, creating standing to sue, making it clear that individuals um, um, have a, a, an interest in enforcing uh, laws that are adopted by Congress. I think we should modify the so-called Chevron rule. Uh, by legislation, we should modify the so-called Chevron rule of extreme deference by courts to, administrative, uh, to federal administrative bodies. I think we should return to the Constitution's idea of a smaller, contained federal government committed to guaranteeing the Republican form of government to states. 
but leaving private ordering and the resolution of social problems that are not related to the Constitution to those very same states, which are easier to influence and also easier to leave if one feels oppressed by them. Finally, I think we should recommit our Supreme Court to judicial restraint instead of the imposition of the justices' policy preferences. I'm horrified, I must say, and I rarely speak out against justices of the court. In fact, I never do. This is, to my knowledge, the first time I've ever done this, but I'm horrified by the, the interviews that Justice Ginsburg has given in the last week about various laws that she uh, disapproves of uh, for policy reasons, and which laws she will have the occasion now to pronounce upon constitutionally in the future, including a Texas law involving abortion. Um, I do not think she's going to recuse herself either, and I think that this is all contrary to the rule of law. Am I optimistic that any or all of this will be done? In a word, no. But can it be done if there's a political will to do so? Yes, it can. I think it can. And that makes it worth fighting for because I think the rule of law is worth fighting for. So thank you very much.